Let's now talk to Filipino Young Professional Secretary and Democrat, Gabriel Young. Gabe, welcome back to Afternoon Delight. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Gabe, so we just want to check in. Um, how are you feeling personally and how are the Democrats feeling about uh, Harris's chances right now? Firstly, I'm going to say thank you so much for asking me that because I definitely needed this check-in. Um, I have been jumping around from friends, his watch parties, and also friends in my previous life who I've worked in the government with. And while at first we were very hopeful that what we we're seeing was the red mirage that happened back in 2020, where that number that uh, President Trump was sitting at 230 was going to be that same number that we would have woken up to Wednesday morning on 2020 and see that the more votes that were counted, eventually President Biden won. But now, at least what we're seeing here, um, apparently Fox News just called Pennsylvania for President Trump. A lot of friends in the Democratic Party, um, I live here out in Berkeley, California, Tada, which is known to be one of the most liberal cities, one of the most Democrat cities in the United States. And there's a lot of solemnness going on right now, a lot of gr uh, graveness and kind of how we're feeling back when it was 2016 when Hillary Clinton lost, the sort of confusion of how did we get here again and what does this mean for the next four years, uh, especially that we knew the gravity of the situation, yet what we're witnessing is a huge blow to what we saw as the integrity of our democracy. Yeah, Dave, uh, this is Lord De Vera, no? Um, everyone's saying that uh, the, the, what, what we're seeing now, of course, we do, we, we can, uh, it's not over till the fat lady sings or the fat man dances to YMCA. But um, at this point, everyone's saying, all, all the analysts are saying that it's, this is a kind of reaction to the, all the wokeness, supposedly, of uh, the liberal culture that is, and what does it say about the Hollywood establishment? You have uh, high profile names campaigning for Kamala, but the trend does not seem to indicate going that way. Definitely, I know what you're talking about in, in the sense of this wokeness and this over liberalization, especially in the past four years where President Biden really campaigned on not going back and trying to fix everything that Trump did with a lot of celebrities eventually agreeing, seeing how they were benefiting from the large economic growth that we saw under President Biden. And I say that economic growth very empirically and factually, um, as many economists have reported out how the United States economy has grown and inflation has shrunk to 2%. But what we're seeing in terms of this liberalization and this wokeness is that there were a lot of things that the Democratic Party has failed. And even me as a Democrat, I will admit, the Democratic Party has failed me as a Gen Z or two. The Democrat Party tends to tokenize us Gen Z youth and say that the youth will get out the vote. The youth are the future and all the memes will really cultivate that culture that uh, Trump will lose when in reality, the Democratic Party failed to acknowledge the realities of our situation, the realities that the war on Gaza was really hurting people, the uh, rise of racial ethnic violence across the country, the inability to solve racist attacks and keep people feel safe, let alone solve the arguments of the economy about inflation and the war in Ukraine and just everything that culminated in an economic externality and stress upon us United States constituents. And so, and maybe this is another blowback, just as we saw in 2016, when the Democratic Party really pushed Hillary Clinton onto us rather than Bernie Sanders, who was that really radical perspective that Trump also gives as well. And so um, while I still, again, holding that, I'd say 5% of me that is still hopeful that, hey, maybe uh, I can wake up tomorrow morning and maybe that 10% of ballots that weren't counted in Pennsylvania yet might flip the tide. I am now starting to work on processing about the failures of what just happened the past few years and uh, what that means for us as political operatives moving forward. Mm -hmm.
Gabe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there are around roughly 1.7 million Filipinos in California. You threw this question out there uh, just a while ago. Um, what are the main concerns of uh, the Filipino community? Uh, what do they want addressed? And what does the trend mean uh, in the current elections? What does that mean for the next four years? Absolutely. So. AAPI data, uh, standing for Asian American Pacific Islander data, and Asian Pacific Islander American Vote, APIA Vote, recently released a survey um, in September surveying the Filipino American community on their interest and if they voted in September, who would they vote for? And surprisingly enough, 68% of Filipino Americans said that they were going to vote for Kamala Harris, with another 14% for Trump, and then the rest, I believe that was a 4%, 5% uh, as an undecided or an other candidate. And so with that in mind, what was at the forefront of those Filipino Americans voting for uh, Vice President Harris was one, reproductive rights and freedom, especially in the pro-choice, pro-life movement. Uh, the second one being the economy. The third one being um, the third one being foreign affairs, fourth being health care, fifth being immigration. And all of these issues all stemming from the fact that Phil Ams are predominantly in all of those sectors tended to, while again in this survey, while it was 68% for Vice President Harris, a lot of Phil Ams still tended to still side with President Trump. Um, and I will also put it out there that even my own uncle and my own family oh, yeah. is one of the leaders of the Phil Ams for Trump fans. And so while it has made an upcoming Thanksgiving dinner very awkward, <laughs> it really has shown us the reality of the situation that while me as a Gen Zer, I may be for uh, Vice President Harris because my issues being reproductive rights um, or my own community, especially all my friends and, um, and then also transgender rights, but then also the economy where I felt I was benefiting. I can go to Tesla and buy a Tesla and get $7,500 back in a tax rebate because yeah. of the Biden-Harris administration. But knowing and going forwards, I can't really put that same faith into the upcoming administration, whereas my uncle out there really believes that he, <laughs> despite not hitting that tax bracket that the tax cuts that Trump is proposing, he believes he's going to benefit. And so. Really, it's those five issues again: economy, immigration, foreign affairs, healthcare, um, and reproductive rights are just everything that is on the table for Phil Lamb. Yeah. One of the surprises, Dave, you mentioned reproductive rights, and one of the surprises that we, everyone thought that abortion was going to be a big talking point, a big issue. It turns out um, the numbers don't speak that way, you know. But Dave, I'm it's going to be an interesting noche buena table. <laughs> Uh, this December, I, 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 I really uh, think. Uh, uh, so what's the next? Uh, I just, I just want to press you on that thing you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. About the please do, please do. Tokenization of you as an uh, as, um, American Filipino. Uh, how does that exactly work? I mean, can you give us certain specifics? Absolutely. So uh, for viewers who are also wondering about what tokenization is, it is this term that's been coined from academic diversity, equity and inclusion yeah. uh, spaces it's talking about how institutions, whether that be the government, whether that be schools, whether that be companies, really highlight their quote unquote diversity by pushing their racial ethnic minorities to the forefront or even doing hiring practices uh, based on that. And for the record, I'm not talking about affirmative action, which is yeah. an entirely separate issue, yeah. but more so, let's say if someone wanted to apply to, for me, I go to UC Berkeley yeah. uh, for my master's. If someone wanted to apply to UC Berkeley, tokenization in this case would be UC Berkeley putting me on the brochure and saying, look, Asian Americans can thrive I here. See. And so mm. I essentially, become the token and if you will uh, the model minority and what has been seen though is this tokenization and this model minority status and myth is actually really false it's a myth as I was alluding to because when we break down the data for example we recognize that East Asian Americans and I'm not throwing my, my other Asian American brothers and sisters on the bus for the record I'm Chinoy so I also count as Chinese but like 
Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, they all tend to do well because of this model minority myth and the investments in said community or their immigration status. We take a look at Cupertino, for example, and Apple. Most yeah. of them are Chinese American wealthy families and they can send their kids to good schools. But when we look at Filipino Americans, let's take a look at Cerritos, California. They don't have that same income investment into the property taxes that lead to good schools. And therefore, those students end up not going to the great schools and that doesn't continue that cycle of generational wealth accumulation. And so overall where I'm getting at is that the Democratic Party tends to tokenize those voices, whether that be racial minorities or even the youth like myself, and really just push that at the forefront of the messaging and showing that this is the future when what we're seeing tonight, um, it might not actually be. However, I will say as well, um, there is power though in I'm not going to say us tokens, but more so us minorities and us youth actually giving rise and voice. And there's a study by Pew Research saying that by 2040, the United States isn't going to be a white majority anymore, but people of color are going to make that majority. However, what we see is in the next 16 years, with four of it being a part of this 16, a lot of that progress to reach those conditions of equity and equality to make sure that tokenization doesn't exist anymore in 2040 uh, might be very much hindered because of the divisive and exclusionary policies that might come with another Trump administration. So I know I answered your question in tenfold, but there's a, so much at stake now that we have to prepare ourselves for an incoming Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Gabe, uh, we've been talking about Pennsylvania and how crucial that state would be uh, it being one of the swing states and uh, one of the biggest electoral votes. Um, but what other uh, key states is there to watch um, and how big of an impact will they have if uh, Pennsylvania's trend continues and goes to the Republican side? So here is the very dreary reality that I'm about to express is that in the current situation, uh, former President Trump has won Georgia and he's won North Carolina. And by winning Georgia, North Carolina, North Carolina being 16 electoral votes, Georgia being, uh, give me one sec, let's see, my computer decides. 16 as well, yeah. Let's see, let's see, another 16. Mm -hmm. So that's 32 already there. And as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the 230 number that before Georgia, North Carolina was called, that would have put him at 262. And then plus with another swing state, maybe that would have put him over that 270 mark. And so um, if Pennsylvania has gone, again, red, that'd be that 32 plus 19 um, being 51 and putting President Trump at 281. And so the sad reality of the situation is if Pennsylvania has gone red, then unfortunately Vice President Harris has lost. And there is no such state that she can win now that can allow her to come back if Pennsylvania goes to President Trump. So even if uh, in Nevada it goes blue and Arizona goes blue, Wisconsin, Michigan, they go blue, all those votes still will not amount to that 51 that President Trump has accumulated from those three key, key swing states. Yeah. And so, again, it's more of a time of accepting the reality, but again, I am 5% naively hopeful <laughs> that maybe a miracle will happen overnight. And I'm not saying and pushing the narrative of maybe votes will come out overnight, like conservatives say, but just the hope that every vote will be counted and that our integratable election process will come to fruition. Dave, you deserve a very, very big drink. And uh, I just want to ask Unfortunately, you I don't really drink much, but oh, I'd be happy to have a good halo uh, halo or a sago mm. galaman with you sometime. It's not too late to start learning. But I just want to ask about, let's say, the uncles, mm -hmm. What is their mm -hmm. issue against uh, Kamala Harris? Is it an issue of gender? Is it an issue of, I mean, uh, have, they have the uncles imbibed that sense of, oh, um, she is not of our, let's say, race, mm. not of our tribe, not of our you know, group. Is there an othering that happens? Yes, absolutely. And however, I will not just pinpoint it on the titos and lolos out there and manongs because I also do believe there is our 
conservative sect of uh, titas and uh, lolas out there who are voting uh, conservative and voting for President Trump. And the reason behind that all, and I primarily go to social media for it, I look at my uncle's post still, um, and also to the Asian journal Phil M. targeted op-ed that Vice President Harris put out. And even though Trump didn't put one out, of Vice President Harris got a lot of bashing on that op-ed from the community, uh, primarily because of one common crucial factor, which is Catholicism and religion. I see. And so a lot of people have really pushed out that, uh, just as we saw at Madison Square Garden, that Tucker Carlson and the other conservative personalities said that they have framed Kamala Harris as the Antichrist, primarily for the single issues of uh, supporting LGBTQIA plus rights, particularly for gay marriage, or even supporting pro-choice movements, which uh, people immediately assume that if you're pro-choice, you mean you're pro-abortion, which yeah. again, that's false logic that goes down that line. And then also that she um, is not Catholic herself, or she supports drugs, or she supports a lot of law, um, or a lot of crime and rampancy, when in reality, that's not true whatsoever, and we see our community being very divided on, on Facebook forums, on Instagram comments, showing that, again, for people who want to pursue that knowledge of caring for one another as the golden rule that Catholicism puts out there for us, that Kamala Harris's policies allow for the opportunity economy, allow for the care for the other person, um, and allow our community to even be seen. However, it is still that dominant factor of Catholicism yeah. being ingrained mm -hmm. into Filipino uh, psychology and eventually when people immigrate Filipino American psychology and sociology that being Catholic then gets associated with Filipino identities and so it's very hard for titos and titas who are first-gen immigrants to really break apart from that yeah. however one thing that I also like to introduce as I cap this off is the second gens like myself and the youth that a lot of us uh, after exposure to different philosophical topics, the critical thinking education system here in the United States, that we ourselves tend to sometimes distance ourselves from Catholicism and reshape our identity to be more American and therefore the Filipino American identity comes from. And so what we see is that intergenerational gap of titos and titas uh, tending to vote more conservative, but us youth tending to vote more liberal because of our separation of religion yeah. with our own identity. Yeah, Dave, before we say goodbye, as you wake up to that new orange dawn, you deserve a big drink again. And a halo halo. Thank and you. Halo, halo. Maybe one day we can, you and I can share it. Yeah. But thank you so much for having me. Um, and I wish you all a very good luck to the next four years under this big orange dawn as well. All right. Thank you once again. That was Filipino Young Professional Secretary and Democrat Gabriel Young.